So I went in with higher expectations than normal with this episode of Star Trek Discovery, Season 3, Episode 7, Unification, Part 3. Did it live up to them? Well, not entirely, but I was a little biased with this one because of the whole Romulan Vulcan angle. It's one of my favourite parts of Trek. There will be spoilers ahead. So Tilly gets approached to be the next first officer of the Discovery. My literal notes read Tilly, XO, WTF, Saru, no. My reaction to hearing that was akin to Tilly's own shock as she heard, then Stamets as he was then told. So appropriate reactions all around then. However, having been given some time to reflect, it's not as catastrophic a mistake as I first thought. I'm just saying though, she's going to have to work super hard to prove to me that she's a good fit for the role, but I'm willing to give her a chance. If nothing else, it'll be fun. In that way, I guess my reactions mirrored the crew's, from shock to, well, I'll support the choice, and if it doesn't work out, they will. The position is only acting with no official promotion in rank. Unorthodox, but not without precedent. The typical first officer, however, generally needs to be able to whip out the intimidation card. I started out in this review by exploring all the various number ones in Star Trek and the dynamics they had with their captains, but after several paragraphs I decided that would make its own video. Suffice to say, the typical role of a first officer is to provide a buffer between the captain and the crew. The crew needs to unquestioningly follow the captain and fear the XO, but there's nothing traditional about neither Discovery nor the circumstance it's found itself in. As far as I can tell, there is not a Starfleet Academy, so where is Tilly going to conclude her command training? I believe that, much as in wartime Starfleet doctrine, most cadets would be learning on the fly, and at least she's a commissioned officer. I hope that she performs well under pressure. She did a good enough job in the Mirror Universe, so it could be that she just needs a push to get her to follow her chosen career. And while the Enterprise D, for example, was having a new crew cycled through constantly, except the senior staff, Discovery, like Voyager, is isolated from whom it can choose from. This has served to construct the familial environment that Discovery has, dysfunction and all, so why not give her the chance? Still, we'll see if she can cope, but as of right now, I don't see it. Introduce a new dynamic and character growth, and until then, I'll reserve judgement. That Starfleet was actively pursuing many FTL methods to replace warp drive is a plot thread I'm glad they didn't just sideline with a single dismissive back in episode 1. I want to know more about this SB19 research tech, but it looks like it could be a myriad of things. From the hologram it was a gateway portal thingy, so it could be a form of interphasic catapult, which throws ships into an energy dampening realm for a time, but one where physics works differently. It could be a repurposed Iconian gate, a folded space transporter like the Sicarian's spatial trajector, or an artificial wormhole. There's always the possibility of a transwarp network like the Borgs, but that also needed dilithium as far as I'm aware. I need to know more, please. The mention of the Federation growing too big to oversee the little problems is a weakness that has been present for a while. It's not omniscient, and in Picard the failure of the Romulan evacuation is one such example of Starfleet dropping the ball. You can look at AI rights as another blind spot for the Federation law. Until Data's trial, there was no precedent. Such small cracks lead to division, and divisiveness has ever been the enemy of the stable UFP. This led Nivar, the renamed Vulcan, now home to the Romulans, to leave the Federation, in part. The final straw was the SB-19 experiment, which Starfleet forced the Nivar Science Council to continue against advice. Whatever the result was, it coincided with the burn, and whatever info they gleaned pointed to SB-19 as the cause. So around 3089, Nivar withdrew from the UFP, which meant that it no longer had to share its development and free exchange of scientific research. They concluded that SB-19, which looks like some form of gateway tech, it's Iconians, again was better off not seeing the light of day. Despite Nivar's falling out with the Federation, it seems to be doing rather well, although like Earth it has its own issues. The Romulans and Vulcans have formed into three political parties, two of which place their respective species over the other, and the middle ground which seems to be slower to act. 
Funnily enough, the way they settled the to Callan Kett scientific inquiry was for Burnham to basically make the most Federation decision she could, withdraw her demands and simply offer to share the results of her future findings regardless. As the request is nullified, President Tarina donates the data anyway, and also because she toth has a mad crush on Theru. You can't tell me not what to ship. Yeah, Gabrielle Burnham being one of the Kuat Malat made me say, you what me lad? Although her emotional reunion didn't do much for me, honestly because I was too busy being kind of stunned with how out of nowhere it was, her actions as Chassette to Michael I enjoyed. Michael was under the impression that acting like a Vulcan and arguing solely with logic would yield the day, but her mother cuts her down to size so she can build herself back up truthfully before the quorum of peers. Not only does this help her realise certain truths about herself, but it engenders her conviction, which is what Tarina responds to. Gabrielle was not there to raise her daughter, Vulcans were. And as a result we have a Michael Burnham who attempts to utilise logic to substantiate her emotional claims. Her mother is a reassertion of her human roots, she all but states as much in the show. And it peels back layers of self-imposed Vulcan ideals from someone who at their core is an emotional being, a human, not a Vulcan. It was arrogance combined with attempts at Vulcan logic that made Burnham mutiny in the first place years ago. In many ways, her attempted mimicry of Vulcan ideology may have served her well to fit in on Vulcan, but not anymore. So I'm glad that her mother could step in and provide a course correction, a unification of Michael's conflicting upbringings. Tying Spock into this episode was nice, and to see him remembered in near reverence by Nivarans? makes me think of him in the same vein as Surak. For them, Spock is now a historical figure that set in motion a plan of healing, much as Surak once did, which is probably why attributing Spock's development to Burnham did make me harumph a bit. At least they provided a reason as to why it had to be Burnham to save the day again this time, but if she's the main character, they'll need to keep coming up with reasons, unless she gets back to a command position. Now she's sticking around, maybe she will return to the first officer position, where she'd be suited most. I also need to point out again that I dig the Romulan Vulcan aesthetic, the deep green cloth with Romulan angles combined with the Vulcan cut of the robes. Shway cool. Overall, I enjoyed the aspects of the show that I was already looking forward to, and I was kind of let down that we didn't get to see more. Instead, we got some development for Burnham, which I'm okay with, it's just that all that doubt that was raised at the end of last episode about her future was completely resolved in the next. It could have lingered somewhat before being sorted, but that could be me just wanting more Nivaran history. I hope we get back to that soon. Plus, Saru needs to meet up with Serena again. What do you think the SB19 experiment was? Wormholes, interface, warp, catapult, drop me your theories below. Maybe it was an Omega Molecule powered gateway. Thanks for watching this video review on Unification Part 3. I've been Rick and I'll see you later for another review or lore video. Goodbye.